of this here, but in my mind, I feel like it's going to fall if I touch it. So I will leave it and hope I don't bump it. All right, last week we talked about Mormonism, right? Um, this week we are going to discuss one that most of us are probably more familiar with seeing out and about in the street or at your door. Uh, Jehovah's Witness. All right. So, um, can you hear me now? Is it good? Is it okay? Can you guys hear me? Can you hear yourself? I, I can. Yeah, all good inside. All good on the inside. All right. Um, but we're going to discuss this week Jehovah's Witness. Now, some of you may obviously have seen them oftentimes maybe at the subway station, Maybe they come and knocked on your door. Uh, maybe at one point you were interested in it or had an inkling for it. Or maybe you have a relative uh, that's part of Jehovah's Witness and you're familiar with it that way. Um, so there could be varying degrees. Um, I, I think, although you know we have some Mormon uh, missionaries that come through, I think really more of us have contact with Jehovah's Witness more so than Mormons uh, here and about our city. But I could be wrong. Maybe you feel the, the different uh, different about that. But I, I, I see that I myself have more interaction with a Jehovah's Witness than, than a Mormon um, just out and about on the street or whatever. Um, Jehovah's Witness are very, very faithful at going out and evangelizing. And, and their big thing is door to door, right? And it's really something that they're told that they need to do, and it's part of the, the things they need to do to kind of be good and earn their works, but they go door to door and try to tell other people uh, about what they believe and try to get them to join in their belief system. Um, so, I don't know if you ever had them knock on your door. Have any of you ever had them knock on your door? Yes. Yeah. 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 I, I had them knock on my door once, and they have never come back. Um, so we were talking, and I don't, I don't think it was really the right way. Uh, I, I don't know if this is the right way. Uh, but we were talking about something. I said, I'll be right back. And uh, I grabbed my Greek New Testament, and I came back out with it to kind of be like, now where does it say? They've never come back. Um, so I don't know if they like wrote down my address to like don't go by his house or, or what. But um, you know, and it, we'll, we'll get to it in a little bit. But there's a good opportunity to share the gospel with them when they're coming to share your their beliefs. But hey, it's a good chance to look in the scripture together. But um, let's pray, and then I want to kind of go through some similar ways that we went through uh, Mormonism, and then look at some Bible truths as well. So, Lord, we thank you for letting us look uh, into really this other belief, and I pray that our hearts would be tempered to really what the truth of your word is. We want to believe what your word says, and then we want to share that truth with other people. We want to be used by you to help them understand and see the truth, that they can be set free from their sin, and they can really have true life. And so I pray that you would open our hearts even as we look at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, it's interesting because if you ever see their literature, they're passing out this different literature, there's like scenes of great beauty, mm -hmm. right? And it's so pretty, and they talk about great words that humans really want to experience. Joy. Peace, happiness, life, right? Like, none of those Christian, Christians included, none of us are like, I don't want that. You know? It's not like you wake up today and say, I really hope I'm not joyful. I really hope I don't have peace and happiness today because, you know, I'm just serving the Lord and He doesn't want me to have peace and happiness. But no, actually, God wants us to have joy and peace and life. Those are from Him. And those are good things. And so you hear those things and you want them. 
What person struggling in life, going through whether it's a difficult time with, with a marriage or struggling with a, a, a relationship of some sort or financial difficulty, doesn't want peace, doesn't want security, doesn't want those things. And really, it's advertising to the, the needs and the desires that people have. And it looks nice, and it looks pretty, and they even dress nice and look nice. They don't look sloppy or anything like that. They look, appearance-wise, very good. And so that's part of the deception, too. Not that dressing nice is deceiving. Uh, I'm going to take it away. If you took it that way, I'm sorry. So like a cult, or, or as cults are, they have leaders. Whether a person or a group of people that they follow. Now, as, as we'll, we'll talk about, it, it's a little different in one sense for them, but uh, we'll, we'll explain that. So it was founded by a guy named Charles Taze Russell. All right? This guy was from, he was born in 1852, and uh, he was raised in uh, a church, and he would hear the Word of God, maybe a, a different taste of what we're used to, but he would hear the Word of God, and uh, he didn't really care for some of the things that he heard. Uh, he didn't like the fact that there was a hell. He didn't like that. Hell was not a glorious place, but that doesn't mean it's not real, right? And there were different things that he heard he just didn't like. So eventually, uh, he kind of started like a, a, a Bible uh, study type thing, and he was leading that, and he went with another kind of church group for a little bit, and he broke from them. But in 1879, he launched his own magazine, which that eventually became known as The Watchtower. All right? So he started uh, that magazine publication, which is semi-monthly. This magazine is created, and they distribute tons of it. Tons of it. Years later, in 1896, he founded what's called the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society. And then, in 1908, he moved from Pennsylvania to Brooklyn. You guys, you guys know where it is, right? Whenever you ride the uh, the B or Q, you're going up over the, the Manhattan Bridge. It's those beautiful uh, creamish colored buildings with green, right? The green windows or whatever. They got a lot of problems. They got really big buildings. Very nice. They, move. they, move. they don't what? No. They're not there. Oh, they're, upstate. No. they're upstate. I apologize. They used to be there. That's where they were on that island. Did they sell those buildings? Yeah. Yeah. Wow, that was a good piece of money. I take it all back. You guys knew more than me. So they're upstate. Well, they used to be in Brooklyn. All right. They they moved upstate. I don't have that written on my stuff. <laughs> Sorry. Wow. That's a, wow. Sorry, now I'm overwhelmed with the amount of money that they have with uh, the sale of that property. Wow. Well, anyway, Russell made a prediction that in 1914, Armageddon was going to happen. All right? And uh, Armageddon is not as we know it from the Bible, uh, but really it was um, a time when God would destroy all present governments and end the Gentile times. And he was going to establish his kingdom in 1914. So it's year 2021. Do you guys have any record in history of Armageddon happening in 1940? It didn't happen, right? He was a false prophet. And uh, he, anyway, he predicted that it was going to happen. Well, he had his series of teachings, and people were listening, and he had followers. They were called Russellites. And they were following Russell. And um, there was another, I believe, another pastor who had written something against him. And who he was, his character, and, and the fact that he wasn't educated and he, he, he wasn't able to, um, he wasn't really ordained by anyone and all these things. And Russell took offense and sued him for uh, libel. Like, he's, he's blaspheming and slandering my name with these comments about me. And so there was a court case. Now to go against 
this pastor, he has to therefore prove that those comments are false. So he has to prove himself to be educated, to know different things, to have actually been ordained, and so forth. And so there was a court case that went through all of this. And it turns out, through the court case, um, Russell did not win. Turns out those things were true. And during the court case, he was actually found guilty of perjury. He lied under oath. He would say one thing, and then even as they kept questioning, he kind of changed it a little bit, and then at the end, it was totally opposite. So he was guilty of lying under oath, even through the court case. Russell ended up dying in 1916, and after that, a new man took over for, for the most part. Once again, there was uh, some factions that went off, right? But his name was Joseph F. Rutherford, and he took over in 1917. And uh, he eventually changed the name in 1931 to Jehovah's Witness, uh, as we know the name today. And uh, he, he got that from Isaiah 43. So he changed the name of it there. Now, it is interesting. This is what's really interesting. You know, like Mormonism, we talked about last week, <coughs> Joseph Smith. They hold true to Joseph Smith, his teachings, right? They'll, they'll honor whatever Joseph Smith said. They will claim today that they don't follow Russell. Because they know as well, he's guilty of perjury, you know, his character doesn't really show up. So... So it seems like today they won't necessarily claim to be followers of Russell. But what's interesting is they still follow Russell. They follow his teachings. What, what he would have said, uh, his beliefs, are still the same beliefs. But yet they would, they would say, no, no, we, we don't follow Russell. But they do. And so uh, the, the things Russell had stated in his beliefs... Their beliefs are still in line and still the same. So, you know, don't think, well, when I'm on the street, I'm going to go after Russell and say, prove, you know, you shouldn't be following him because they'll probably say, yeah, we don't follow Russell. So it's not really like the Joseph Smith one where he's like, oh, Joseph Smith was a horrible guy and you shouldn't follow him. They do, but, but in this case, they're going to say, no, we don't follow Russell. So there, there is one change there. Now, with cults, we've also discussed about their different writings or different sources of revelation, right? They use the Bible, but they've changed it. They have their own translation of the Bible, all right? It's called the New World Translation of the Holy Scriptures. Uh, it was first published in part in 1950. They revised it in 51, 61, and 84, all right? So... It's been revised. So it turns out, even before 1950, before they did the whole Bible, they had come out with a, another another version. Uh, or another, like, uh, I can't remember the name of it, uh, New World Translation, something about the, the Greek text, right? They had come out with that. And they tried to claim that all these years, the Greek scholars that, that, that have been translating or have translated the scriptures in the past did it in error and were basically led by tradition and religion in the way that they translated. So they are now translating it correctly. But it's really interesting because none of the people that have been involved with them for the translation are known as Greek or Hebrew scholars in the world of translation and of those texts and of those languages. So yet they're claiming to be like the best translators, but yet they're not really scholarly in those languages. So it turns out one, one of the presidents, um, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, uh, I think it was over there, he, he at one point was on trial and he claimed, he claimed to have been knowledgeable in Hebrew, 
Greek, and the, the, uh, he was being questioned, I don't know if it was uh, necessarily a trial, but he was being questioned, and, and they were questioning him about, um, you, you, you say you know the Hebrew, and yeah, I know the Hebrew text, and he eventually got to a point, and the, the person said, all right, translate Genesis 2-4 from English to Hebrew. Fluent, you know, ready for Hebrew, couldn't even do something like that. And so it was then taken to Hebrew scholars. Was that a hard verse? Is Genesis 2 4 like a really hard verse, and that's why, you know, we couldn't do it? And it was stated anyone who's done first year Hebrew can do Genesis 2 4. So they claim that they have this knowledge of the original text. But yet it's false. It's a false knowledge. And really what they've done is they take it and they use it to twist it exactly out of context to be whatever they want said. Claiming that they're knowing the real language, but in reality it's not even close to the way Greek or Hebrew is supposed to be translated. And so they're twisting it. And so they, have, they had to make their own version of the Bible. Now, we know there, there are many different versions of Scripture of, of, of the English translation. They, they go from Hebrew to English and Greek to English. And, um, you know, there's different translations in, in, in that sense. But this one is completely different because they're not desiring to be in line with the Hebrew or Greek. Their desire is to just make it say in English what you want it to say, Right? It's, it's a big difference. If, if someone is translating something, to be a good translator, your goal is to have it say in our language, in English, exactly what it said and meant in Greek or in Hebrew. Right? That is real translation. In this case, it's, it's not translating. It's, I want it to say this, and I'm just going to say that that's really how it should be translated. Right. Other writings that they put out is the Watchtower magazine, uh, twice a month they send that out. And then they also send out, uh, a, that's really written for the followers, the Watchtower. Then the other one is called Awake, that's written for, really for people that aren't followers, trying to get them to come you know, to the faith of Jesus. All right. Um, I wanted to mention, sorry, so, so now that they don't really follow Russell and so forth, they actually, they follow what's called a um, governing body. So it's kind of like the leaders that they follow. They, they're going to follow whatever direction they say and whatever they do. So here's some of the, the rules that they have for this governing body. So Jehovah's visible organization under Christ is a channel for bringing the divine interpretation of His Word to His devoted people. They are the ones that can tell you and teach God's Word. It's not like what the Bible says, where the Holy Spirit will teach you. It doesn't work that way, right? Our governing body will tell you, not God. Um... They say, if we are to walk in the light of truth, we must recognize not only Jehovah God as our Father, but His organization as our mother. Right? So we have to make sure we, you, you follow that as well. To receive everlasting life in the earthly paradise, we must identify uh, that organization and serve God as part of it. Really, it's, that's where they get their authority. And so they have these, what's called Bible studies. Right? The, the followers are supposed to go to a congregation or church or whatever uh, every, every Sunday, and they'll have two different types of meetings there. But during the week, they'll have a Bible study. And it, it's not a Bible study like we would have, right? We would have a Bible study. We would literally open the Bible. We would look at it together and, and go through what God's Word is teaching. But their Bible study is understanding what the Watchtower publications and what the, the, the organization is having them learn and be taught. It's really sad. These people are deluded 
by following the leadership of other people and not looking into God's word themselves. And it's interesting because they don't really they don't really want them to think. All right. Um, have no dealings with apostates, which we would be the apostates today. All right, because we we. We love God's Word, and we love the Lord, and we would teach what God's Word says. So we're apostates to them, okay? Have no dealings with apostates. For example, what will you do if you receive a letter or some literature, open it, and see right away that it's from an apostate? Will curiosity cause you to read it just to see what it has to say? You may even reason, it won't affect me. I'm too strong in the truth. And besides, if we have the truth, we have nothing to fear. The truth will stand the test. Mm. And thinking this way, some have fed their minds upon apostate reasoning and have fallen prey to serious questioning and doubting. They are telling their people, don't even read the stuff from the apostates who are proclaiming the Bible, because if you read that, you might start to see that they're preaching the truth, <laughs> right? Yes. They're, they're preaching the truth, and you'll realize that we're a lie and we're false, and you might you might even believe it. So don't even read it. Isn't it interesting? Right? Satan has blinded the eyes of men. And look, they're just doing exactly the same thing. They are blind, and their desire is to keep other people blind. <coughs> Don't, don't follow that. Don't go after that. Just stay with us. Don't even read it because it's it's going on. It's, it might tease you. Uh, yeah. I sat next to one, a woman, a young woman, for a few months, and we talked about God, and it came out that she was a JW. And we agreed that we would talk about our faith and not be hostile. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I couldn't get her to explain is why they believe only 144,000 people are going to heaven. What happens to the rest of the faithful? She didn't quite explain when I told her that I believe the 144,000 are 12,000 from each tribe of Israel who are going to be witnessing and bringing people to Christ. And that they are just a tiny, tiny remnant of people who will be in heaven. And we could not really connect on that right. Um Yeah, it's interesting though that they tell their people don't don't read other stuff. Don't have an open mind. Don't don't look into other things because it might lead you astray. But yet if they are trying to win other people to their thinking it is taught from their own writings, the truth that leads to eternal life. They teach this. We need to examine not only what we personally believe, but also what is taught by any religious organization with which we may be associated. Are its teachings in full harmony with God's Word, or are they based on the traditions of men? If we are lovers of the truth, there is nothing to fear from such an examination. It should be the sincere desire of every one of us to learn what God's will is for us and then do it. So it's like they're teaching their people, or teaching us, teaching other people, have an open mind. Learn, examine, really find out what's the truth. But for those that are already part, keep your mind closed. Don't even read anything. Don't even, you know, peruse it. You might think that you're solid in our teaching, but you might be led astray by the truth of God's Word, right? So it's very interesting that the kind of thought, um, thoughts that they have in, in the way that they teach their people. So really this is their leadership. They have the different uh, writings that they use, right? Their, their own translation of the Bible, uh, the Watchtower, Awake, and numerous other pamphlets and books that they produce and distribute like crazy. They are very active in getting out their message. They, uh, I believe it was, you put in, you, you put in like 12 hours, 1,200 hours a year in evangelism, and, and you're, you're kind of labeled. If you put in over 1,200 hours a year in evangelism, you, you're called something different. You have like a different title. 
right? You earn a better title among the congregation. 1,200 hours of evangelism. That's a lot. Right? What's the math? 100 a month. 100 hours a month spent specifically in evangelism. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot. It's a job. It's crazy. Going door to door, knocking, knocking, knocking. But they're faithful in doing it. Now, it's part of it because you gotta, you got to do it to kind of be good enough, to kind of earn enough to get to heaven, right? It's exhausting. But you want to be good. You want to do well. And really, I think it would also tickle the, the, the inkling we have as, as people. I'm looking better. Right? It's, it's look how religious I am. When I gather at the congregation... They know that I have put in 115 hours a month at events. Wow, Mr. So and So is really stellar. Look at how much of anything he does. And and it can be just like the Pharisees in the Old Testament, right? Doing their works and, and appearances before men, looking better before other people. You guys, our desire in serving the Lord should never be so our church can see me, other people can see how I'm doing, I, I'm really becoming more religious, and I'm, I'm really loving God, people are seeing me. It's not about that. It's about serving the Lord from our heart. And we are to be doing that 24 hours a day. Serving the Lord is a full-time job every part of the day. And it's not something we should count differently, right? I'm living my whole life for God. Lord, I want you to use me and, and work through me in getting my kids ready for school in the morning. Normally not the most righteous time. <laughs> Get your shoes on! We're five minutes ago! Right? Not, not the most righteous time, but you know what? That's, that's when we're also supposed to be filled with the Spirit serving the Lord. In the car. Or on the train. Going to work. Supposed to be serving the Lord. At the job. Serving the Lord. Even perhaps with the ridiculous task of typing something in an Excel spreadsheet. That's what I do a lot of them. Right? Or, or, you know, I don't know, there's different jobs. Maybe sweeping the floor, cleaning the toilet. It's all to be served, service for the Lord. And then getting to share the gospel while you're sitting at work. Talk about the Lord. You go to the break room and somebody just randomly starts talking to you about things. It's kind of weird. What's going on? Hey, it's a chance to serve the Lord. And we don't have to distinguish, well, I was able to put in 45 minutes of ministry for the Lord today. No, it's, it's you've got the whole 24 hours. Discipling your kids at the dinner table, after dinner. Are you, how are you using your time in the evening? Are you serving the Lord in the evening by sitting down and turning on the TV and watching it for three hours before bed? Or do you use your evening time for service and ministry for the Lord? And service and ministry in the Lord doesn't necessarily mean you're on the street passing out tracts. That's not the only way you serve the Lord. You listen to the Lord and see what He wants you to do, how He wants you to get involved. We're not to segregate our lives with... Me living, okay, and then over here I'm going to serve the Lord. The whole part of living your life is serving the Lord. Guys, that's a difference for us. He has our whole life. Take it. Use it however you want. We know a lot of the arguments that they have and uh, the beliefs that they have. Look, they, they say Jesus is not God. Right? Jehovah, they say, God the Father, 
He's Almighty God. Jesus the Son is a mighty God. He created Jesus, and then Jesus would then, He created everything else. But He's not Jehovah. He's not God. Yeah, so it, it's really, that's, and th there's a couple passages that are the big passages that they mistranslated in their version of the Bible, which most of us probably know is John chapter 1, right? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Yes, that's what the Jehovah's Witness say, a God. They say He is a God. Yes, exactly right. They throw in A, and then they put the small g in there. And then they'll go through this, well, in the Greek it says, right. But yet, all Greek scholars say, no, it's actually translated, and the word was God. And so they mistranslate it, and that's one of their big verses, because that would be one that we would go to right away and say, look, Jesus is God. <laughs> and they say, yeah, that's right, so we're going to have to change that. Right? It says that. You're right, so let's change it. All right. The other one is in Colossians. That's right. Colossians chapter 1, if you'll turn there. Colossians. That's right. Colossians 1. So we'll start with verse number 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in life. That's what the Father has done. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Alright, so now we're going to be talking about the Son, Jesus, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by Him were all things created. That phrase. That's exactly right. They change it. And in brackets, in their translation, they put, for by Him were all other, unbracket, things created. Everything else was created by Him. He first was created, and then He created everything else. But that doesn't even fit the context. You keep reading how great we're, the description of Jesus is here. He created all things that are in heaven, in earth, visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. All glory is to go to the Son? Who gets glory? God. You're telling me the Son is to get preeminence and glory, but yet you're saying He's not God because you throw in the word other? It doesn't even fit the context. Jesus is supreme. Jesus deserves glory. Jesus deserves worship. Because He is God. He's amazing. We, we mentioned this a, a couple weeks ago in Revelation chapter 5. The Lamb is given great worship. And who deserves worship? God only. Only God deserves worship. We get to show them Revelation 5. We get to show them that He, the Lamb, receives the worship. The Lamb receives the praise. Another, another thought to leave with you and, and another passage to share. And a friend of mine mentioned this uh, even yesterday. 
could ask them, what is the name above every other name? What name is above every other name? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah. But let's say you're asking them. Oh. Jehovah. 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 Right? What name is above every other name? Jehovah. Well, that's great. Philippians chapter 2 says, Wherefore God, in verse 9, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted Him, that's Jesus, and given Him a name that is above every name. And then he says that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of John the Father. The fact that Jesus is God still gives glory to the Father. Because they're one. They are together. They bring glory to one another. Never at any moment it, it is one trying to get more glory than the other, right? It's not like the Father's like, oh, I'm going to get more glory than my son today. Or, or the Holy Spirit is, I give me the glory. No, they work together so that all of them, as one God, is getting the glory. Not multiple gods competing for the glory, but together as one, receiving glory as one. Different parts, different persons, but, but one God, and all for the glory of God. Yeah? I think this is something that's fundamental to their belief system, that they do not believe in the Trinity. Yeah. And they don't believe the Holy Spirit is a person. They believe he's an active force. So that's why they said the Holy Spirit is the term out. They said it's pagan. <laughs> the Trinity is pagan. So they deny that. That's right. That's funny. I like how you put it. They just threw them out, right? Yeah, yeah. If, if it ever goes, you know, if, if you don't like what it says, just throw it out. <laughs> yeah. First John 5, 7, and 8 is the Trinity. And some versions of our own have changed those, those two verses. But First John 5, 7, and 8 is clearly the Trinity. And a job of witnesses have totally changed that. And you can't show them your Bible because they want to change the subject. Mm. Do you want me to read it? Uh, sure. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in uh, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. That's right. Um, all right, so <laughs> the, the quote in, um, in, sorry, in, in, in Philippians chapter 2 is, is a quote from actually the Old Testament, Isaiah 45. And I want you guys, if, if, you, if you would, turn there, Isaiah 45. Let's see what's being said in Isaiah 45. Verse 18, for thus saith the Lord, who is, who is the Lord? Who would they say is the Lord? Jehovah, Jehovah right? Mm -hmm. That created the heavens. Wait, I thought, I thought Jesus was the one that created the heavens. Didn't we just read in, in Colossians that He created the heavens and the earth and everything? So even if you throw in the word other... Here it says that Jehovah created the heavens. Hmm, that's interesting. God himself that formed the earth hmm, and made it. So wait, if, if, if this means that Jesus is creator and Jesus is God, are you now telling me that there's two gods? So now it, 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 they're, 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 they got to figure it out. Is is Jesus? If Jesus is a sub God, now you got two gods, not one. He hath established it; he created it, not in vain. He formed it to be inhabited. 
I am the Lord, and there is none else. Well, that solves that problem. There's not two gods, right? There's only one. <coughs> I have not spoken in secret in a dark place of the earth. I said not unto the seed of Jacob, Seek ye, me, seek ye me in vain. I, the Lord, Jehovah, speak righteousness. I declare things that are right. Assemble yourselves and come, draw near together, ye that are escaped of the nations. They have no knowledge that set up the wood of their graven image and pray unto a God that cannot save. Tell ye, and bring them near. Yea, let them take counsel together. Who hath declared this from ancient time? Who hath told it from that time? Have not I, the Lord, Jehovah? And there is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. So once again, there's no other God. There's one God. But yet, it says that Jehovah created all things. And we already see that Jesus created all things. So Jesus is Jehovah. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness, and shall not return. That unto me... Who's the me? <coughs> we say Jesus, but according to this passage, if they are Jehovah's Witness, who's the me? Jehovah. 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 Unto me, Jehovah, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. And yet, when Paul is quoting this, he is very clear to say to Jesus, every knee will bow before Jesus, Jehovah, and every tongue confess that Jesus is Jehovah. There it is. He's God. And it's the truth that they dismiss. Look, our desire, once again, is the same as with anyone else, should be that they understand the truth of the gospel. That they hear from God. That they turn to Him and say, That should be our desire. Our desire shouldn't be, I'm going to win this argument. I'm going to make you mad. I'm going to prove to you. Our desire should be one of love to point them to Jesus the Messiah. Look, maybe you see Him on the street passing out a magazine. Maybe it's a good opportunity for you to witness to them. They're there. I don't know if they're ever going to knock on my door again. All right? They, they know that dude's got a Greek text. He's not. They'll knock on his door. So they may never knock on my door, but maybe I'll see him out walking down the street. Maybe I stop and say, hey, what's going on? Let's have a talk. Because I want them to know God. I want them to be with Him. We shouldn't just dismiss them and disclose them and put them out and say, oh, well, they're, they're false teachers and have nothing to do with it. We can hate their message, but we need to love them, right? And so that needs to be our goal. Take the love of Jesus to them and let them see Jesus is Jehovah.